So, good afternoon and, and welcome. Um, that, feels, that feels like a really fast year for Sintercast, and it's good to be back at the AGM. I always enjoy to be here to tell the story, and it's a really good story. Um, production is up, uh, installations are up, uh, the result is up, and the dividend and the share price up along with it, um, and, and the outlook is really good. So, it's a good story, and I'm happy to be here to share it with you. Uh, let's begin, as we always do at the AGM, with a review of the growth in our production over the last 10 or so years. Um, we can begin by re trend. We see a really good positive growth trend. Um, starting from the end of 2009, we had a good recovery coming out of the US uh, economic recession. Um, we also had the start of production of the Ford 6.7 liter V8, which continues to be our highest volume program. Uh, so, really good growth until 2012. There at the same time we had the European economic downturn and also the stop in production of the Navistar 13 liter engine because of an emissions non-compliance issue. So the volume went down, but again we recovered, both because of the recovery in the economy, uh, because of the return to production of the Navistar engine, and just generally new things coming on stream. It leads us to 2016, where we had record everything. Um, 2017, we presented as a bridge year, and it went a little bit longer than we expected, but still, uh, we had forecast that it would be a bridge. And then we come back into the growth in 2018. And since 2018, we've had a really strong growth from first quarter of 2017 until first quarter 2018, it was 25%. And now from the first quarter of 18 to the first quarter of 19, at 24%. Um, taking 2018 as our base with 2.5 million engine equivalents, we had 2.9 million in January, uh, 3 million in February. So we issued the press release at having broken the 3 million milestone. Um, it was 3.4 million in March. And I'm happy to say that we were able to sustain that level, and we reported again 3.4 million in April. So that's our new normal, somewhere in that uh, 3 to 3.5 million engine equivalents. Um, we can also look at the compounded annual growth over this period, and what we see that from 2010 until today, and uh, more recently until today, um, solidly in double-digit growth. And I believe that we can maintain that type of growth rate with more than 10%. Um, we have very good visibility for three years because that's the normal lead time in the automotive industry. Um, but now that we have the new agreement with Scania, which we uh, signed and announced on the 29th of January, and that Scania program will ramp from 2021 until 2025. So it gives us a longer visibility than normal. And this is the basis of us saying that we believe that we'll be able to maintain double-digit growth for the next three to five years. Um, we can also look at the production. This is now the first quarter of each year's over the same time period. Um, last year, I think we had a really healthy balance in our production. It was 51% passenger vehicle, 38% commercial vehicle, and 11% other components. And as you will recall, when we say others, we refer to um, automotive components other than cylinder block and head, and industrial power components, off-road, construction, rail, marine, agriculture, this type of uh, application. Um, this year, when we come to the AGM, the balance has biased a little bit more toward passenger vehicles. It, it's because we had a really strong growth on the passenger vehicle side. Um, last year, in fact, our passenger vehicle production grew by 57%, so it increases from 51 to 56. Uh, commercial vehicles grew by 29%, and our other category decreased by 34%. So, um, if, if you do that math, that we were 11% of 2.5 million engine equivalents last year for industrial power, and this year we're 7% of 3.1 million engine equivalents, it means that we lost about 60,000. So, it's not a big reduction, it's more of a dilution, 
And I'm absolutely confident that we get those 60,000 back, that we continue to have growth in the industrial power sector. Um, the main reason for the growth in the last few months is, of course, that we started production of the new Cummins 6.7 liter inline diesel engine. It started production in the fourth quarter um, and then it ramped up very strongly in the first quarter. It had a fast ramp because it was replacing an existing engine. Yeah? There was a 6.7 liter produced in conventional gray cast iron and we replaced that with our CGI engine. And this is actually an overhead that we use to present our production to customers. And I just wanted to share it because we had said potential volume would be approximately 300,000 engine equivalents per year. And in fact, the engine has been a lot more popular than that. So it's selling beyond our initial expectation. And that's helped a lot with the, the recent growth. And why does it sell so well? It's really this 1,000 foot pound of torque. It's primarily for the North American market. So it's the first super duty truck to reach the 1,000 foot pound of torque. And you see that the towing capacity has been increased by 12.5%. So this is a 6.7 liter CGI engine that replaced a 6.7 liter gray iron engine and gave an added 12.5% of torque. And that's what CGI brings because so there's no, dis, no increase in displacement. It's purely that we have a stronger material so the engine design guys can push it harder and get more performance. We speak of specific performance, the horsepower per liter or the torque per liter. And, and here a really good increase. And at the same time, as they increase the performance, they reduce the weight of the engine by 27 kilograms. They haven't broken that down, but we know that more than half of that is because of the CGI cylinder block. So this is what CGI brings to the design community. Um, as I say, a lot of the growth is because of this common 6.7 liter engine, but the entire segment is doing really well. So the Ford 6.7 liter V8, which I mentioned earlier, is still our largest volume production program. It also grew 25% between the first quarter of 2018 and the first quarter of 2019. So it's been a really strong contribution for us. Um, we're primarily linked to the diesel, as we say, with the Cummins 6.7 and the Ford 6.7 liter V8. So let's take a little bit of time to put our diesel exposure in perspective and, and to look at the, the outlook for the diesel passenger vehicle market. Um, our current split, as we showed earlier, 56% passenger vehicle, 37% commercial vehicle, and now 7% industrial power. So when we look at the exposure to diesel, let's focus on passenger car, because for as long as anyone will forecast, a commercial vehicle and industrial power will remain the domain of diesel. Yeah, there isn't any risk that electrification will take over or that the material will change to aluminum. It's simply not strong enough. So that's the domain for Sintercast. We'll just focus on the breakdown of the passenger vehicle market. Um, this year, 16% uh, of our passenger vehicle production is gasoline and 84% is diesel. If you go back last year, it was 20% petrol. So initially it looks like perhaps our petrol engine volume decreased, and, but it hasn't. Our petrol engine volume, again, from first quarter of 18 to first quarter of 19, increased by 25%. And um, the reason that it went from 20 down to 16 is simply a dilution because the overall passenger vehicle market grew by 57%. So we've had really good growth on the petrol side. And um, if you do the math then, and um, 84% of 56% means that 47% of our production in the passenger vehicle sector is exposed to diesel. Yeah? And we see that diesel volume is decreasing, um, but I want to remind that all of our applications are for large vehicles, whether they are pickups, super duty pickups, or SUV. And when the diesel volume is decreasing, it's primarily for small passenger cars. This is, continues to be a stable market for us with a stable outlook. Um, when I mentioned the 16% uh, petrol engine, um, I think that petrol will continue to increase, but perhaps the percent share will decrease simply because the diesel market is growing faster. 
Um, but I am happy to confirm that our second petrol engine has been approved for production and we expect that to start production in 2021. Yeah? So we now have a second reference in the petrol engine sector. So let's continue with our exploration of the diesel market and, and how that shakes out. This is uh, data from the European Association of Automobile Ma Manufacturers. And you see that in 2017, the split was 44% diesel and 50% petrol. And then in the top, we have this small amount. So the yellow is alternative powertrain vehicles. Think primarily natural gas, uh, LNG, um, LPG, C uh, CNG, LPG. Um, in green, these are electrically charged vehicles. So it can be a pure electric vehicle like the Nissan LEAF or a plug-in hybrid. And in red, hybrid vehicles. So think they're the classic Toyota Prius. Moving from 2017 to 2018, um, diesel decreased from 44% to 36%. But you see that most of that decrease has been taken up by petrol engine, yeah, not by electrification. And if you go back to 2016, the diesel penetration would have been 52%. So from 2016, around 50%, and then around 44%, and now around 36%. There's a lot of discussion in the industry as to where it will end. And most of the analysts and the OEMs and experts think that it will be somewhere in the 20s. So, so let's look at that in a little bit more detail. Um, in 2023 to 2025, the European forecast is that the market will produce and sell about 21 million vehicles, passenger vehicles. Um, let's say that the diesel take is 25%. So that's something more than 5 million diesel engines. Today in Europe, Sintercast is selling approximately 250,000 diesel engines. It's less than 5% of the market opportunity. So I think even if it decreases, it's still a huge opportunity for growth. 95% of that market and more than 4.5 million engines, and these are bigger engines, so it probably means like 8 million engine equivalents, are still available for us to grow into. So I don't see it as a threat. To the contrary, I see it as a growth opportunity. Um, the other thing to point out while we're on this overhead is that even in the green piece of the pie, that 2% of electrically charged vehicles, many of those have engines, right? They're not all pure electric vehicles. They can be plug-in electric uh, hybrids with uh, electric and internal combustion engine. More than 98% of the vehicles have internal combustion engines. So while we hear so much about electrification, what we don't hear is still more than 98% of the vehicles need an engine, and that's where we work. Um, the market is, of course, forecast to grow. The number of cars will increase in the future. Um, today, it's around 90 million. In the year 2030, most people forecast that it will be 120 million. So even though electrification will increase, I think that it's the most likely scenario that the industry will produce more internal combustion engines in 2030 than it will in 2020. We're still in a growth market. So that's a look at Europe, which is kind of the home of diesel. Let's uh, take a look at North America because that's the home of our main end user market. And this is a forecast from PricewaterhouseCoopers that goes out to two, uh, 2023. And we see in red, gasoline engines, in the light red, diesel engines, in the pink, it's hybrid, and in the gray at the top, these are either pure electric vehicles or plug-in hybrid vehicles. So we see the same kind of thing out in 2023. It's still well more than 95% of the engines are internal combustion. And even in the gray category, many of them will have internal combustion engines. But what's interesting to see in this is that the diesel share is increasing. Yeah. And, and why is it increasing? It's because of the fuel economy rules where the Obama administration took a corporate average fuel economy from 27.5 miles per gallon up to 54.5. We don't know where they're going to finish now, but it will be something in the 40s. Um, so still, there's a real demand on the industry to improve fuel economy. Um, and here we see 
a list of the top 10 best-selling vehicles from 2018. And the first point is that the top three are pickup trucks, as they have been for the last nine years, as they will be, again, for as far as anyone is brave enough to forecast. And, and what is really the point of this slide is that each of those top three um, have introduced diesel engines. So the Ford is now on sale with our 3-liter V6, the Ram pickup equally on sale, and Chevrolet has announced a diesel engine which will come in the near future for Silverado and also for Sierra. So in these large vehicles that people are buying, um, there is actually a growth in diesel. Um, an another point to make is that uh, the Ford F-150 uh, was the best-selling vehicle in the world last year. It was the only vehicle to sell more than one million units. Normally the Toyota Corolla also makes it, but last year it was only the Ford F-150. And our little 2.7 liter V6 petrol engine is the base engine. So I think Sintercast can be really proud of the achievement of having the best selling engine in the best selling vehicle in the world. A great achievement for our company. At the Detroit Auto Show in January, uh, Wards Auto always uh, hosts the 10 Best Engines Award in Detroit. And this year, our diesel for the F-150 won one of the awards. And in, in giving the award, Wards wrote, um, diesel engines are ideally suited for big, rugged pickup trucks. And the smooth, quiet 3.0 liter Power Stroke V6 available in the 2018 Ford F-150 is exactly what the market needs. A light duty engine capable of remarkable fuel economy while towing heavy loads for work or pleasure. So it just echoes this need for diesels, both to meet the fuel economy requirements that are legislated and also for the demands of the consumer. And we don't really hear a lot about diesel growth in the market, so maybe the, the story that I give now is a bit of a surprise. Um, but with the help of our friends at the Diesel Technology Forum in Washington, I just made a small summary of uh, vehicles that are available in the US market with diesel engines. You see along the top line the Chevy uh, entries uh, with the uh, mid-size uh, Colorado, the full-size uh, Silverado, and of course the Super Duty. Then our Ford F-150, Ford F-250, uh, the Jaguar and Land Rover. Um, at the, D uh, sorry, at the New York Auto Show in April, Mazda launched two new diesel engines, the CX-5 and the CX-30. Um, and the far right side is the Nissan Titan, again with our 5-liter V8 diesel. The Ram 1500, again Cintercast, and the Ram 2500. And there are more coming. And the next one's up. It's the, the Wrangler, the Jeep Wrangler, which will have a diesel engine and also the new Jeep pickup truck going by the name either Scrambler or Rubicon. So these will be launched later this year, and both of them with diesel engine, and it will be our 3.0 liter V6 diesel engine that are used in other FCA applications. So again, another growth opportunity for us and another reinforcement of the need for diesel engines. Um, out of the 25, so I only showed some of them there, and then when we add the two Wrangler vehicles, we come to 27. 11 of the 27 that are available are available with Sintercast diesel options. Yeah, so we have really good penetration in that market. Uh, let's come back then to this graph. We've talked about uh, diesel cars. Let's also talk about uh, diesel trucks. So despite this really strong growth that we had, this 57% growth in passenger vehicles last year, we still believe that commercial vehicles are the biggest long-term growth opportunity for Sintercast because this is where they really have a need. So engines will be downsized, um, but performance can't go down. So the performance has to stay the same or even increase as it did in the 6.7 liter for Cummins. And the only way to do that is to push the engine harder. And every time that the OEM pushes the engine harder is an opportunity for CGI. So the trend is suiting our growth opportunity, particularly for heavy-duty commercial vehicles. 
Um, we have two competitors in this sector. We have to compete with conventional gray iron, showing that CGI is stronger and stiffer, and so it can make engines lighter and smaller and more performant, more fuel efficient. And, and of course, also electrification. Um, electric will grow also in the heavy duty sector, particularly for vehicles that go back to a fleet base every night for charging. Um, but for long haul road transport, there's no viable alternative currently to the diesel engine. And it's a huge growth opportunity for Sintercast. Um, so how do we see that growth opportunity? We see it in the investment made by Scania. So in December 2017, they committed to build a new foundry here in Sweden. Uh, the foundry is exclusively for CGI, for cylinder blocks and for heads. They have environmental permission to produce, to melt uh, 95,000 tons per year. And they invested 155 million US dollars. Yeah. So why do they invest that money? Because when you invest that amount of money, uh, you have to think of a long payback period. If electric trucks are just around the corner, they never make that investment. And the investment in the foundry is peanuts. Yeah? Think of the investment in the engine itself, because they're building an all-new 13-liter engine, right? And probably in the investment in that is closer to $1 billion. You don't make that investment unless you're going to run it for 15, 20 years. And if electric is coming around the corner, you simply don't do it. Um, likewise, just last month, Volvo announced here in Sweden that they would invest 165 million US dollars in the foundry. And they're doing that again because they know there is a long-term demand for diesel engines for heavy-duty applications. So what, what you read in the newspapers, what you hear on the television, um, that's one perspective of the story. But I would encourage uh, to base your outlook on what the OEMs are actually spending money on. Yeah, These are the guys who know, and they're doing it because they need these engines for the long term. Um, again, no viable alternative. It is the biggest growth opportunity for Sintercast, and it will be for the next 10 years. Uh, moving from our production to the installation outlook, uh, we mentioned in the press release this morning that we have a really strong outlook for new installations. Uh, on the 28th of January, we announced the installation at uh, CSIC, China Shipbuilding Industries Corporation. That installation is finished, and so we'll see the, uh, the revenue recognition for that in the second quarter report. Um, Kimura is a rapid prototyping foundry. You may recall that we installed in their foundry last year in Japan. The initial intent was that the Japanese headquarter would develop the expertise for CGI and then transfer it to the US foundry. After they installed the equipment, they realized they needed it in Japan as well, so they decided to keep it and now they buy a second unit for their foundry in, in the United States. Um, we announced that on the 8th of May, and the intent is that it will be installed in June. So again, should appear in our second quarter P&L. We're also working on uh, system upgrades. We have one upgrade in North America to take a system from System 3000 to System 3000 Plus, increasing the automation. And another upgrade here in Europe where we're taking a System 2000, an older system, up to the current System 3000 standard. So that's from the core CGI activity. Uh, we also have uh, installation growth for our tracking technologies. Um, we see here the Poitra uh, ladle tracker. Um, that was announced last year, but uh, our engineers are on site. It's in Canada. Our engineers are on site this week making that installation, should clearly be completed and again appear in the second quarter. And Poitra is great. For us, it's four new things. It's our first installation for ductile iron. Until now, everything we have done is CGI. So this is purely a ductile iron foundry. They won't produce CGI at all. Um, that means that it's our first standalone installation of tracking technologies. All of our other trackers uh, piggyback on the computer of our normal CGI system. So it's the first standalone. And for us, the third new thing, it's our first installation in Canada. It makes our 14th country with an installation. 
and it operates in the French language, so it becomes our 11th uh, language where we program the equipment and communicate with the local operators. So again, really great stuff, 14 countries, 11 languages. Uh, on the tracking technology side, also last year we signed an agreement with Tupi. You'll recall that Tupi already has a ladle tracker in their foundry in Mexico. And they've had a really good experience with it. They decided to invest in it for one of the lines in Brazil. And it looks like we'll be making that installation during the summer, so third quarter. Um, but if we add them up, the CSIC, the Kimura, the two upgrades, and Poitra, um, it looks like the second quarter is poised to have approximately 5 million Swedish crowns of installation revenue. If you take our historical average from 2010 to 2018, it's exactly 7 million. So it's a really strong quarter, and it's the basis of us saying that we think that we'll have above average installation revenue this year, because there's more in the pipe. Um, yeah, and speaking of the pipe, on the 29th of January, we, ins uh, we announced the new installation at the Scania foundry. It will be installed next summer, uh, summer 2020. Um, so it will appear in our 2020 installation revenue. But that has a value of approximately 5 million Swedish crowns. So again, a really good head start for next year. And we believe that we'll have above average installation revenue in both 2019 and in 2020. And from there, the tracking technologies will grow, and I think our historical normal of around 7 million will have to be shifted upward. So as we speak about uh, the tracking technologies, just a few words about our ladle tracker technology. You may recall that we put these tags on every ladle. We put uh, RFID antennae at key locations around the foundry, and as the ladle passes by each station, it registers, and it gives us an opportunity not only to track the ladles, but also to control them. So we've been doing this at the Tupi Foundry in Mexico for more than three years now. Um, it allows us, it allows them to prevent the pouring of out of specification iron, yeah, to avoid the production of bad castings, and also to identify opportunities to improve the efficiency. They can see where ladles fall out of the process and assign an engineer to go out on the shop floor, see what's happening at that bottleneck location, and try to improve the efficiency. So I think it's a really neat technology. It's so far unique to Sintercast. Uh, we see in Poitras that it's applicable also to ductile iron foundries. So it, it's a really neat uh, development for Sintercast. Um, as we mentioned in the bullet points, as the ladle moves through the foundry, if it skips any step, when it arrives at the next step, it won't be allowed to proceed. If any of the control parameters are too low or too high out of the specification, the ladle will be stopped. Um, normally in a foundry, if we pour 100 ladles at the melting area, we'd like to take 100 ladles over to the pouring area and cast them into molds and make money from them but some of those ladles never make it across the finish line. And with this technology, the, la the, the foundry knows exactly how many fall out of the process, they know where they fall out, and they know why they fall out. Um, normally a ladle will have something like seven or eight minutes to be fully poured, and the foundries don't have a good calculation of how many ladles are not fully poured. But with Ladle Tracker, they know exactly how many get timed out. And again, it allows them to go and troubleshoot the process. So it's for process control, but also for process optimization. It has a real value to the foundry. Uh, the Sintercast Cast Tracker. Um, we're currently undergoing a trial of the cast tracker. Um, it's been going on for about six months now. It's an extended trial. We hope and we believe that the customer will purchase it at the end of the trial. So that's something that we're working toward. Maybe more installation uh, revenue for the second quarter or the third quarter. Um, you see here the starting point is that we engrave a unique identification code into a small sound core. We then put that core into the core package where we make the cylinder block. And at the same time, we put a sticker on top of the core package. Because once that tracker core goes into the core package, we can't see the code on it anymore. 
but we print a sticker with a 2D matrix with exactly the same identification code. So at any point in the process, we can take a picture of that label and know the identification of the core package. When the core package goes into the molding flask, yeah, we can't see the sticker anymore, but we transpose the identification of the sticker onto the radio frequency identification tag you see on the bottom right hand corner of the, of the flask of the mold. And so as the mold moves through the process, we only have to measure the radio frequency signal from that little button to understand the identification of the casting inside. And then after the production, of course, the casting has the same product code. We can read that and we know the full history of the casting campaign. Um, so the advantages, it gives us traceability. So now we can track the, 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 the progression of the casting from what we call inception, which is the moment that the cores are produced and assembled. Uh, we can identify the birth, which is when the iron goes in, when we pour the casting. And then at the end of the process, we have to shake the casting out of the sand to allow it to cool and process it further. So we also know the details of the shakeout time. So it gives full traceability. It also allows us to control the process. If the cores are either too young or too old, we can flag it so the foundry doesn't have a higher risk of pouring bad castings. And one of the things that's really difficult in a foundry is to identify the ladle or the pot that a casting came from. So we do that. But not only do we identify the pot that it came from, we can tell the foundry if it was the first casting or the third casting or the seventh or the last. So we know the exact sequence. So it's very powerful for them to go back and to troubleshoot and find the root cause of defects. And of course, when you know the root cause, you can also solve the problem. Um, so that brings us to the troubleshooting. All of the data, both from the cast tracker, the sand side of the process, and also the ladle tracker, the liquid metal side of the process, are compiled into a single database. Today, most foundries are still documenting on paper. When the engineers want to track a casting, they have to spend a lot of time to pull together the papers and, and track them. Uh, invariably, there are some errors and omissions, so it's really difficult to build correlations. Today, with cast tracker and ladle tracker, they can just go straight to the database and start to analyze the data. So what we're doing um, previously in a foundry, castings could be identified as coming from an eight-hour production batch or maybe even a 24-hour production batch. And what we've changed now is that every casting is a unique individual with his own um, row in a database with all of the information about his production. And that stays with the casting from the manufacturer all the way through uh, to the machining and the engine assembly. If the OEM scans the vehicle identification number on the front windshield, they will know the minute that the cores were produced. So it's really bringing a new level of traceability and control to the foundry industry. And I think it's, uh, again, a neat technology. Uh, for the employees inside of Sintercast, I, I always say that uh, I grew up on the CGI side of the business, right, through the 90s and developing that technology, and, but I really love this tracking stuff. It's a really neat uh, technology. Okay, so looking forward, uh, we see that we will have growth in all sectors. We'll have growth for passenger vehicles, for commercial vehicles, and also for industrial power. And that growth includes the second petrol engine, which again, I think is a real milestone for Sintercast. Um, really positive about installations. We will have above average installation revenue in 2019 and 2020. Um, the tracking technologies will start to make more of a contribution. We've been promoting them now for a couple of years. The industry is starting to become more familiar with it. We have production references, so it's starting to get traction. Um, we have six ongoing at the moment. We have the ladle tracker uh, in Tupi in Mexico, which I said has been running for more than three years. Uh, we have the ladle tracker that we're installing in Canada this week. Uh, we do have a ladle tracker installation in Katharina Home beside our technical center at the SKF foundry. Uh, we have some elements of cast tracker at the Scania foundry here in Sudetalia. Um, we have the ladle tracker that we've sold to Tupi in Brazil, which we intend to install during third quarter. 
and, and also the cast tracker trial that we showed the pictures of uh, just a few minutes ago. So it's starting to, to gain momentum. Uh, the GIFA is really something for us to look forward to. It's the World Foundry Trade Fair. It happens every four years in Dusseldorf, and this is a GIFA year, so next month we'll be, here, be there. And this is a picture of our stand from the last GIFA in 2015. And so we're looking forward to GIFA. We're going to launch our System 4000. It's our fourth generation process control system. And we're also going to take that opportunity to launch an updated website. So look for that. should come on the 25th of June. Um, and at the same time, we will initiate a more active LinkedIn campaign. So, so look for that. Um, Sintercast will send an invitation to its shareholders to welcome them to follow us on LinkedIn. And we'll be more active on that platform as well. Um, and finally, our growth. So very confident to be able to maintain this uh, more than 10% double-digit growth throughout our five-year planning horizon. It's a growth in all sectors for passenger vehicle, commercial vehicle, and industrial power. Um, so I hope you'll agree uh, it's really good progress, it's a good story, and there's a really good outlook. Thank you. <laughs>